To the vast majority of mortal denizens within the Imperium, the Space Marines are immortal champions, dispatched by the Emperor himself for their safeguarding. Yet, akin to the majority of biological existence across the galaxy, even the Space Marines are mortal. Within the Imperium, however, exists a technology permitting the Astartes to battle for the realm of mankind, even after receiving mortal wounds. For the greatest of heroes never perish, they invariably return clad in steel. The origins of these cybernetic combat walkers remain a mystery, yet the appellation Dreadnought echoes from the times of the Age of Technology. The precise appearance of these contraptions is lost to antiquity, but their widespread presence was undeniable, found amongst the techno-barbarian tribes and distant human polities, as well as within the early adherents of the machine cult on Mars. These engines of war shared several traits. They were of modest size, permitting operation by the common folk. However, similarities ended there. Each dreadnought was modified to suit specific necessities, rendering the identification of the original model impossible. With the advent of the Imperium era, prototypes of these walkers would be utilized to develop the Space Marines' dreadnoughts, thus christened as proto-dreadnoughts. The Imperium boasts a vast array of diverse Dreadnought models. Yet now, all war machines are more standardized, with their pilots being exclusively wounded Space Marines or Custodes, though the latter may volunteer for entombment within the sarcophagus willingly. Yes, a burial it is indeed, for once a pilot is entombed within a Dreadnought, they are doomed to wage war in its confines until death claims them. Many civilians and even members of the Imperial Guard perceive dreadnoughts as mere walkers, akin to Imperial Knights or the battle suits common amongst the Adeptus Mechanicus. But this is not so. Yet few are inclined to dispel such rumours. What then becomes of an Astartes before they ascend to become a full-fledged pilot of a dreadnought? The chosen Space Marine is submerged in amniotic fluids and surgically implanted into an armoured sarcophagus. Through the use of thought impulse units, they are then connected to the sensory systems that allow them to hear and see as though they were still made of flesh and blood. Additionally, a Vox system is connected to the sarcophagus, enabling the Astartes to communicate with their brethren. Once the sarcophagus is sealed, the pilot remains interred within until their demise in battle. The sarcophagus, equipped with a life support vault, grants the Space Marine a form of biological immortality, but this boon comes with a dark downside. As centuries pass, the hero's mind gradually loses its grip on reality, making them increasingly difficult to awaken. There is also no definitive evidence to suggest whether a warrior entombed within a sarcophagus might eventually succumb to madness. Furthermore, not every Space Marine who sustains grievous injuries will be entombed in a Dreadnought, for there are several compelling reasons for this. Firstly, the technology to forge new Dreadnoughts has been lost to the mists of time, with but fragments of knowledge remaining, allowing the creation of but a negligible number of new walkers. This gives rise to the second reason why not all Astartes are eternally encased in metal. To be entombed within a sarcophagus is a privilege awarded only to a venerated veteran of the chapter, for a warrior's experience is far too vast and valuable to be lost. In all chapters of the Astartes, burial within a dreadnought is the greatest honour that brethren can bestow upon a mortally wounded hero. However, it is the chapter master alone who decides who is worthy of the sarcophagus, after consulting with the chief apothecary and the company chaplain of the troop in which the fallen brother served. By tradition, each dreadnought bears a scroll upon its sarcophagus, inscribed with the name of the hero currently resting within. When a new warrior becomes the pilot of a dreadnought, the machine assumes his name. In any case, if a warrior is deemed worthy, he likely will be entombed in a Castroferum model dreadnought. This model is considered the most widespread throughout the entire Imperium, as it boasts a broad array of weaponry and, surprisingly, lends itself well to modification. The exact origin of the Castroferum remains unknown, but according to the Imperial Archives, it was forged or rediscovered simultaneously or after the Contemptor Dreadnought. The Castroferum features an exceedingly unadorned and simple design, with angular armoured chassis equipped with a pair of legs and a pair of manipulators bearing weapons, 
which are propelled by power fibers and magna coils. Dreadnoughts are sheathed in enormous plates of cast adamantium armor. The thickest of these plates safeguard their shoulders, sarcophagus, and leg apparatus, defending the most vital components. The least armored are their dorsal surfaces. Depending on the tactical objective, a dreadnought may be armed with a variety of weaponry, yet one of its limbs is always equipped with a melee weapon. This could be a power claw or power fist, its might exponentially surpassing that of its infantry counterparts. Typically mounted beneath the close combat armament is either a storm bolter or a heavy flamer for engaging infantry masses. However, the primary force of devastation in a dreadnought comes from its ranged armament. The arsenal of a dreadnought is vastly diverse, capable of being armed with nearly every weapon known to the Imperium, from assault cannons to heavy plasma weapons or multi-melters. Also at its disposal are combined variants of auto and las cannons, heavy bolters, as well as missile launchers. By the 42nd millennium, the Space Marine chapters remain armed with the Castroferum Type 4 and 5 dreadnoughts. These dreadnoughts were first forged upon the forge worlds of Mars and Incaladian. They boast 75mm plating and reach a height of 3.7 metres. The length of such dreadnoughts is 2.2 metres, with a breadth of 3.4 metres. This model can achieve velocities up to 10 kilometres per hour and weighs 12 tonnes. The majority of the Imperium scholars and the Adeptus Mechanicus deem that the widespread adoption of the Castroferum is primarily due to its more diminutive stature and simpler power plant, thereby superseding the more technologically advanced and cumbersome Contemptor. The lower profile of the Castroferum permits it to navigate spaces where the Contemptor could not, enabling dreadnoughts to partake in assaults upon the star-faring nomads and vessels, as well as engage in urban warfare within the relatively constrained confines of city ruins. Moreover, the Castroferum boasts a rather elementary power system, a standard thermonuclear reactor, a commonality amongst the war machines of the Space Marines. We shall now delve into the models of dreadnoughts, whose the prototype traces back to the Castroferum. The mortise pattern dreadnought distinguishes itself from its brethren through the integration of the cutting edge helical targeting system and the exclusive employment of long range weaponry. The genesis of the mortise dreadnought traces back to the era of the Great Crusade when the legions demanded heavy fire support and formidable air defense systems. In the nascent stages of the Great Crusade and throughout the Horus Heresy, the primary chassis for Mortis Dreadnoughts was the Venerable Contemptor. However, with the cessation of the Civil War, the Space Marines transitioned to the Castroferum chassis. The most significant advantage, as well as drawback of the Mortis model, lies within its targeting system, comprised of the most advanced Avgurs and Cogitators. Despite its remarkable precision and efficacy, the helical system is exceedingly fragile and consumes an inordinate amount of energy, thus halting the dreadnought amidst its barrage. Nonetheless, a pair of heavy weapons equipping the dreadnought is capable of annihilating any target, as dictated by the mission at hand. The mortis is capable of bearing any variety of long-ranged weapon generally mounted upon Castroferum-class dreadnoughts. Yet, in the 42nd millennium, the model is exceedingly rare. Only the Dark Angels and their successors have retained the technology to produce this variant of Dreadnought. Similar to the Mortis, the Hellfire Dreadnought also serves as a platform for heavy fire support. However, this model is never armed with identical weaponry. The left arm of the Dreadnought is invariably equipped with a missile launcher housing eight crack missiles. Unlike the Mortis pattern dreadnought, the Hellfire is capable of unleashing its firepower even as it advances upon the foe. Yet the next two incarnations diverge significantly from those afore described. The Castroferum siege pattern dreadnought forsakes long-ranged armaments in favor of the Inferno cannon, huge variant of the standard flame weapon. In close combat, this dreadnought wields an assault drill upon which is mounted a heavy flamer. Such armaments can breach any fortification, be it of stone or reinforced concrete. The heavy flamer then reduces defenders to ash the moment their sanctuary is breached. 
The sight of a siege dreadnought advancing, incinerating all in its path, often compelled the enemy to cast aside their arms or flee in despair. Additional armaments, such as a storm bolter or twin hunter killer missile launchers, may be affixed to the dreadnought. Instead of the Inferno Cannon, the Siege Dreadnought can be outfitted with a Multi-Melter or a Flame Storm Cannon. However, this variant moves with deliberate slowness. Its maximum velocity reaches but 8 kilometers per hour, though it is lighter by half a ton than its brethren. The Ironclad Pattern Dreadnought continues the lineage of engineering laid down by the Siege Dreadnoughts. Its frontal armor is bolstered by thick ceramite plates, but this additional protection comes at the cost of versatility. In the vast and unending war that consumes the galaxy, the ironclad dreadnought stands as a beacon of imperial might, primarily deployed to breach the fortified defences of the Emperor's foes. Unlike its siege counterparts, it lacks the heavy, long-range weaponry that characterises the artillery of the Adeptus Astartes. Its crowning armament is the Hurricane Bolter, a weapon of righteous fury, extremely effective against the massed ranks of infantry that dare stand against it. However, its wrath is less potent against Armoured Walker of War. Often, the Ironclad is not fitted with any instruments of long-range death at all, opting instead to mount upon each of its hulking arms instruments of close-quarter doom. The Power Claw, the Seismic Hammer, or the Chain Fist. While the might of the Power Claw and Chain Fist echo the destructive prowess of their lesser infantry-based kin, the Seismic Hammer is a tool of devastation unique to the Dreadnought's arsenal. Depending on the forge that birthed it, the Seismic Hammer might resemble a massive hammer, its head adorned with the Noble Eagle, a symbol of the Imperium, as seen on hammers of the fourth design, or it might look like a more technologically advanced construct akin to those of the fifth design. The Type 5 Seismic Hammer boasts four drills that penetrate the walls of heresy and secure the hammer's striking mechanism to a targeted section of the fortification. Yet regardless of the design, the principle behind the Seismic Hammer's operation remains the same. Through the might of hydraulic mechanisms, the hammer's striking part impacts the wall with thunderous velocity, unleashing a devastating shockwave that turns the material of defences into dust and debris. Additionally, a melter gun is mounted on the hammer's casing to soften the blasphemous fortifications before striking. The addition of extra plating has increased the size of the ironclad. It now towers above its brethren models by a full 10 centimetres, a testament to its enhanced durability and its role as a harbinger of destruction for the enemies of man. The armour has been augmented by a considerable measure of 10 millimetres from 75 to 85 Yet the velocity of the Dreadnought remains capable of attaining a speed of 10 km per hour, even though its mass has increased by a metric ton. Among the notable features of this Dreadnought variant, the installation of hunter-killer missile arrays and assault grenade launchers is most worthy of mention. Subsequent incarnations of the Dreadnought, known as Castroferum, were conceived within the sacred forges of the chapter and did not attain widespread dissemination. The Furioso variant was birthed by the Master of the Forge of the Blood Angels in the 35th millennium on Baal. Reflecting the proclivity of his chapter for close-quarter combat, the Master of the Forge modified the standard Castroferum into an assault vanguard unit. For the Dreadnought, two types of melee weaponry and one long-ranged armament, later to be adopted by the foot soldiers, were devised. The Furioso employs either the Blood Claw or the Blood Fists for close combat. In principle, the Blood Claw is akin to the Lightning Claw wielded by the Space Marines. Four blades, ensconced in an energy field amplified by the might of the Dreadnought, transform the Blood Claw into a terrorizing weapon. In the throes of melee, a Dreadnought is capable of sundering entire enemy detachments with a single sweep. Conversely, the Blood Fist resembles the typical Dreadnought Claw, albeit with elongated digits, which facilitate the shredding of armour and the rending of flesh with greater efficacy than its standard counterpart. As with all Dreadnoughts, the Furioso model has the capability for the mounting of additional weaponry on its arms dedicated to close combat. Beyond the standard-issue Storm Bolters and Flamethrowers, the installation of Melter weapons is possible, for more heavy-caliber weaponry, the option for a fragmentation cannon exists. 
This weapon, too, was devised by the Blood Angels, embodying a high-caliber cannon that discharges long, hollow adamantium projectiles that shatter into hundreds of shards upon firing. The sharp shrapnel can penetrate the sturdy ceramite armor of Astartes and the thick chitin of the Tyranids with equal facility. However, there have been recorded instances wherein the shrapnel from this armament was halted by mere standard infantry armor. It is also imperative to mention the dreadnoughts forged by the Blood Angels based on the Furioso template, the Death Company dreadnought and the Librarian dreadnought. The former variant differs from its progenitor merely color and the fact that it encases a brother struck down by the Black Rage. It is noteworthy that the affliction seized the Space Marine's mind when he was already bound within the Dreadnought sarcophagus, for it would be folly to confine Astartes wounded and already taken by the Black Rage within. Another distinctive feature of the standard model is the configuration of the Death Company, Dreadnought. It always represents an assault variant, outfitted with fists or talons. The Dreadnought Librarian also stands as a storming variant of the dreadnought Furioso. Yet it is not a mere battle brother that is entombed within, but a librarian. This variation of dreadnought is armed with blood fists, integrated with a storm bolter and a nemesis force halberd. Moreover, the sarcophagus that cradles the librarian is equipped with psychic hoods for the focusing of psycho powers. Subsequent iterations of the Dreadnought's Castroferum were also forged within the forges of different orders, yet they differ only in their armaments and the internal systems. The Fenrisian Great Axes, much like the Bloody Angels, bear a flaw, hence some of their Dreadnoughts starkly resemble those employed by the Death Company. This concerns the Dreadnoughts, whose pilots have succumbed to the curse of Wolfen, as soon as the Iron Priests perceive that the soul of the Honoured Brother has edged a step closer to its feral essence, they replace the Dreadnought standard weaponry with that of close combat. For all that the Wolfen Dreadnought now desires is to rend and tear asunder. Upon such a Dreadnought, one might either fit the claws of the Great Wolf, which in their functioning principles echo the Blood Claw, or indeed a weapon unique amongst all Dreadnoughts. This refers to the Fenrisian Great Axes. A massive power axe, the height of a space marine, is forged only in the heart of the Great Wolf's fortresses, and for obvious reasons can be wielded only by a Dreadnought. In addition to this, the Wolfen Dreadnought bears in its other hand a vast storm shield, known as the Blizzard Shield. The Blizzard Shield's force field and enhanced resilience bestow upon the Dreadnoughts the fortitude to persevere through the direst of circumstances. It is noteworthy that, by some arcane curse, the Wolfen Blight afflicts even the spirit of the Dreadnought's machine, kindling within it a more ferocious disposition. Yet it remains enshrouded in mystery whether it finds solace after the pilot's demise. However, the dreadnoughts of the Grey Knights, though outwardly resembling the standard Castroferum pattern, harbour technological mysteries specifically wrought for this esteemed order. In mirror to the demon hunter's armour, the dreadnought is shielded by Aegis armour, empowering it to repel the onslaught of demons and the malevolent psychers. Moreover, there exists a unique pattern amongst the Grey Knight's dreadnoughts, christened the Doomglaive. Its nomenclature stems from the Nemesis Doomglaive, with which this dreadnought is armed in conjunction with its right hand being outfitted with a massive Psy Cannon, capable of decimating legions of demons with a singular volley. This variant of dreadnought was forged amidst the Garanhir Rebellion, when the seventh chapter of the Grey Knights faced an entire army of bloodletters. Only the psychic weaponry mounted on the dreadnoughts allowed the Brotherhood to halt the demonic incursion. Since those ancient times, the Doomglaive has been enshrined within the Order's armory, deployed onto the battlegrounds where the Grey Knights anticipate clashing against vast hordes of demons. Like the Librarian Dreadnoughts, these demon-hunting walkers stand as the mightiest of psychers, who have time and again safeguarded their brothers from the scourge of the warp. Additionally, the Grey Knight's veneration of their Dreadnoughts diverges from the customs of other orders. Dreadnoughts of the Grey Knights are regarded as living connections to the origins of the order. More ancient artifacts than instruments of war, living embodiments of the Imperium's grand victories and echoes of ancient times. 
Furthermore, it is often only the Grand Masters and Captains who are encased within these venerable machines of war, further elevating the reverence bestowed upon them. However, with their vast experience, Dreadnoughts can often lead a strike force of the Grey Knights or marshal half a brotherhood to assail the foe from an unexpected flank. Yet, despite the big experience these Dreadnoughts possess, the Grey Knights are loath to disturb their slumber. Only when it becomes evident that the battle cannot be won by the hands of mortals does an ancient awaken within the depths of the Hall of Heroes. The command of the chapter believes that to rouse the Dreadnoughts constantly would dishonour the sacrifice they once made. Thus, after a grievous battle, the Ancient returns to Titan, there to rest and await the next great battle. In conclusion, one must not fail to mention two variants of the Dreadnought of the Castroferum pattern, the Death Guard Dreadnoughts and the Venerable Dreadnoughts. As for the Venerable Dreadnought, it is not so much a separate model as it is a title bestowed upon a brother who has battled alongside the chapter for millennia. They are keepers of ancient wisdom, whose knowledge even a chapter master would seek to harness, regardless of whether the Dreadnought contained the spirit of a common battle brother. Yet prolonged service adversely affects the sanity of the Ancient, making it increasingly difficult for him to awaken with each passing cycle. But the Master of the Forge would nonetheless expend resources to sustain such a Dreadnought, even when there's a high risk that it may never awaken again. In the Venerable Dreadnought, it becomes a challenge to recognize the Castroferum model. For over millennia, they have received numerous modifications and were at times repaired with parts from other chassis. Moreover, these dreadnoughts are often armed with weapons more ancient and unstable than those wielded by their younger brethren. An example of such armament is the power fist of the venerable dreadnought, which, instead of a four-fingered claw, manifests as a fully anatomically correct hand with five fingers. Above all, it is in the dreadnoughts, known as Venerable, the Chaplain's Rest, who throughout the ages have offered their spiritual leadership and projected their hatred towards the enemies of the Imperium. After the burial of its chassis, the Dreadnought is usually adorned with the sacred symbols of the faith, making it resemble the armour of a chaplain. Death Watch Dreadnoughts can also be regarded as venerable to some extent, as this warrior formation possesses exceedingly few combat walking walker. The Space Marine, who is to be entombed within the sarcophagus, essentially swears to serve as a member of the Death Watch until death, for he shall never return to his chapter. Yet a brother, mortally wounded, still harbours a chance to return to his order, for oft do many kill teams of the Adeptus Astartes employ the sarcophagi of Dreadnoughts to transport their wounded to the bastion of the Death Watch. However, should the injured brother wish to remain amidst the Xeno Slayers, he must seek the permission of his Order's Master before pledging his eternal service to the Death Watch. Within the majority of these specific Order's fortresses, Dreadnoughts serve as living archives of data, having witnessed a plethora of different Xenos over centuries of service. Upon encountering a particularly perilous species, the Ancient is roused to consult its sage advice, often offering strategies to combat various aliens, for it once waged battle against them. Moreover, the Death Watch Dreadnoughts are frequently modified to meet the specific needs of the kill team, a practice that stirs unease amongst the more conservative of the Adeptus Astartes. Throughout the existence of the Death Watch, the Masters of the Forge have devised numerous modifications and new armaments specifically honed for the extermination of particular Xenos threats. Thus, some dreadnoughts were armed with siege hammers of the Legio Cybernetica to assail the fortifications of orcs. But there exists another reason why the Death Watch seldom deploys dreadnoughts. A mission requiring stealth becomes an impossibility due to the walker's size and the clamor it produces in motion. Furthermore, not all surfaces can bear the weight of such a war machine. Thus, if dreadnoughts are deployed, it is only as forces of protection or assault, delivering them to the battlefield in drop pod, aboard Thunderhawks, or through the ethers of teleportation. The second model in popularity amongst dreadnoughts is the Contemptor, 
This dreadnought was vastly widespread during the eras of the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy, but over the ages was supplanted by the more simplistic Castroferum. In this age of darkness, where the light of the Emperor grows dim against the encroaching shadows, such weapons of antiquity serve as a grim reminder of the might that once was and the lengths to which the faithful must go to reclaim their former glory. In the pantheon of close combat armaments, the Contemptor stands nearly in the same echelon as the Castrophirum, if not surpassing it with further options. The Contemptor Incendius, forged solely within the sacred Mechanicum Enclave on the moons of Baal, bears resemblance to the venerable dreadnought Furioso. Armed with a power claw that enshrines heavy flamers within its gauntlet, the Incendius boasts additionally the augmentation of jet thrusters. These allow it to descend from low orbit and execute short strategic leaps amidst the of war. Yet the Contemptor finds its most revered iteration within the hallowed ranks of the Custodes. Though it is spoken that only those warriors grievously wounded are entombed within dreadnoughts, it is known that certain Custodes willingly embrace this steel sarcophagus. Often it is the most ancient guardians of the Emperor, whose strength wanes and old wounds torment endlessly, who volunteer for this eternal vigil. As with all possessors of the Dreadnoughts, the Adeptus Custodes imbue their contempt of variants with modifications befitting the guardians of the Golden Throne. In the vein of the Blood Angels, some among them favour the melee, and thus their Dreadnoughts are armamented with weaponry traditional to their sacred duty. The Dreadnought of the Galatus design wields the massive Presidium Shield, a bulwark well esteemed among the Custodes. Its protective barrier, augmented by the Contemptor's inherent shield generators, allows the Galatus to withstand the most devastating of barrages. Clutched in its right hand, the Dreadnought bears the big Galatus sword, infused with the wrath of the Infernus Flamethrower. Behold, the Achilles Dreadnoughts wage war wielding the Big Dread Spear, a weapon much akin to the Guardian Spear. Yet, unlike the Guardian Spear in lieu of a bolter, the Dread Spear comes integrated with a Corvée Las Pulsa, a laser weapon reminiscent of a laser cannon. Furthermore, the Achilles variant is armed with wrist-mounted storm bolters, which may be substituted with heavy flamers or a relic of the Age of Strife known as the Adrathic Disintegration Cannon. Within the arsenal of the Adeptus Custodes lies a Dreadnought, unlike any known to the chapters of the Astartes, the heavy Dreadnought Telemon. In stature, it rivals the Leviathan Dreadnought model, with its design echoing that of the Custodes' Terminator armor. Its origins and creator remain shrouded in mystery, yet it wields destructive power of a truly apocalyptic scale. Imperial records hint at the rarity of such dreadnoughts, for some components of their armour were personally forged by the Emperor himself. Moreover, there were scarce few candidates capable of mastering such a walker. It remains uncertain whether this scarcity was a matter of unworthiness, or if the complexity of controlling such a mechanism proved too daunting for some pilots. Like much of the Custode's weaponry, the armaments of the Dreadnought were of rare craftsmanship and forged using arcane technologies. In close combat, the Dreadnought made use of the Telemon Caestus, a power fist equipped with miniature plasma cannons crafted in emulation of those mounted upon spacecraft. For the ranged armaments of the Telemon, they were equipped with the Arachnus Pattern Storm Cannon and the Iliastus Culverin. Though the Arachnus is dubbed a storm cannon, in truth, it shares but the principle of operation with such devices. For this model is a laser weapon, yet it also employs a rotating barrel assembly. The Iliastus, on the other hand, is a bolter of immense caliber, which was also mounted upon the tanks of the Adeptus Custodes. Moreover, the Telemon was fitted with a spiculous missile launcher, akin to a miniature Apocalypse missile launcher installed on a Titan. And the generator of the refractor field further endows the Dreadnought with semblance to a miniature version of a Titan. Since the overview of the Dreadnought Telemon commenced with mention of the Leviathan pattern, let us then start the account of the last two rare Dreadnoughts with it. The Siege Dreadnought Leviathan was devised by unknown engineers in secrecy from the Mechanicus. 
In its creation, technologies from the Dark Age of Technology were employed and parts of the Dreadnought were personally devised by the Emperor. Rumours suggest that from the resources expended on the creation of the Leviathan, one could forge an Imperial Knight. Nevertheless, this pattern of Dreadnought was hailed as one of the most triumphant, though it was scarce. With the onset of the Horus Heresy, only the Loyal Legions were able to receive the new Leviathan. To the traitors, there remained no choice but to extricate the vanquished Dreadnoughts from the field of battle, intent on refurbishing their big forms to wield them anew against their adversaries. The Dark Reapers were deeply unsettled by the advent of such a technologically intricate and supremely potent war engine, suspecting its creation was for forthcoming conflicts against the automatons of the Legio Cybernetica in the event of an unforeseen crisis between Terra and Mars. Yet, if the Leviathans did battle against the forces of the Mechanicus, it was either at the behest of Horus or in the storming of fallen forge worlds. Like many marvels of the Great Crusade, some Leviathans persisted into the 42nd millennium. Where previously they were deployed ubiquitously, now many orders prefer to consign to oblivion that somewhere within the depths of their fortress lies a mighty dreadnought. The cause of such avoidance is the unique technologies within this model, driving any new pilot to the brink of madness. Wounded space marines become ensnared in dreams of the Horus Heresy battles. Similar to a titan, the spirit of the Leviathan machine seeks to devour the mind of its pilot. Hence, only a few dare to place a mortally wounded brother into such a dreadnought. Solely a magister can command not just the interment in a sarcophagus, but also the deployment of this model of dreadnought. For it is unknown whether the dreadnought will heed the commands of its squad's leadership, or instead charge into battle obeying the orders of long-fallen warlords. As the designation of this particular dreadnought model suggests, its primary role consists of breaching enemy fortifications and annihilating armoured machinery and titanic beings. By its design, the Leviathan resembles a hybrid of the Contemptor and Castroferum dreadnoughts, yet it towers above and greatly outmatches them in bulk. The thickness of its armour remains a mystery, but by appearance the Leviathan is significantly more formidable than its dreadnought brethren, and akin to the Contemptor model, it is shielded with atomantic shielding. In its standard configuration, the Leviathan is armed with siege claws, within which are housed melters. Like the Castroferum siege model of Dreadnought, the Leviathan can also be armed with siege drills. For long-range firepower, this Dreadnought boasts a Leviathan storm cannon. Additionally, it may be outfitted with a Grav Flux Bombard and a Cyclonic Melter Lance. Where the first weapon type is an enlarged version of the Graviton Cannon, the Cyclonic Melter Lance closely mirrors the Arachnus Storm Cannon save for the fact that it emits melter rays in lieu of lasers. Moreover, embedded within the Dreadnought's chassis lie heavy flamers, which can be substituted with paired Volkite culverins. For supplementary armament, the Leviathan employs either a missile launcher equipped with hunter-killer missiles or hull-mounted grenade launchers for deploying Phosphex projectiles. The Deradeo the latest Dreadnought model developed at the dawn of the Imperium stands as a testament to the imperishable might of mankind's martial prowess. This Dreadnought, forged in the era of such walker as the Lucifer and the Castroferum, outwardly bears a more bloated resemblance to the venerable Contemptor class and harnesses many of its technological advancements. Its primary role, distinct from its kin, lies in delivering thunderous heavy fire support. Indeed, this mobile firewalker was embraced with fervent zeal by the legionnaires. Much like the Leviathan dreadnoughts, the Derideo did not initially proliferate amongst the legions due to the prodigious resources required for its construction. However, with the onset of the galaxy-spanning heresy, demand for this dreadnought model surged, prompting a significant increase in its production. Endowed with robust stability and capacity, it served as a trial platform for the testing of new armaments destined for the Space Marines' legions. Its basal configuration boasts a chassis mounted with twin-linked Anvilus autocannon batteries and an Iolos missile launcher, the latter notable for its capability to unleash destruction upon multiple targets simultaneously. 
Similar autocannon batteries were also mounted upon the Titanic Warmaster Titans for anti-personnel defences. The Iolo's missile launcher, distinguished by its multiple target engagement, bolsters the Dreadnought's armoury. Supplemental munitions include the customary heavy flamers or bolter weaponry. However, as principal armaments, it may also be outfitted with the devastating Hellfire heavy plasma guns, Volkite falconets, or the fearsome Arachnus heavy laser cannons. Yet let not the uninitiated conflate the Arachnus armaments mounted upon the Derideo and Telemon chassis. Their likeness ends with their denomination, for the Derideo, Lascanon, operates upon the same principles as the standard Lascanon. Its missile battery, meanwhile, could be substituted with the Boreas air defense missile system, comprising four anti-aircraft missiles. Like other machines of antiquity, the Derideo Dreadnought is equipped with an atomantic field projector and, akin to the Mortis class, possesses the helical targeting array. Yet, in spite of the technological decadence, the Imperium remains capable of forging innovations, not merely resurrecting the technologies of the past. This is exemplified by the Dreadnought Redemptor, engineered specifically for the new generation of Astartes. Mirroring the Leviathan Dreadnought in sheer bulk, Redemptors often tower over their venerable brethren. This Dreadnought surpasses the standard Castroferum model in technological sophistication, able to manoeuvre with a grace and velocity unattainable to its predecessors. However, as with the Leviathan class, such technological prowess comes at the cost of the lives of its pilots. It appears that during the creation of this Dreadnought class, little concern was given for its future pilots, as over time the neural links eviscerate the inhabitants of its sarcophagus, leaving nothing but a blackened clump of organs wrapped in skin. As for its armament, this machine bears weapons for engagement both at range and in close quarters, much like those wielded by its less sophisticated brethren. In the melee, the Dreadnought relies upon its might with the Redemptor Fist and heavy flamethrowers enshrined within its very chassis. The Redemptor Fist, in essence, diverges naught from the standard gauntlet of the Castroferum pattern, save for the fingers of the Redemptor arrayed in a manner most peculiar, and as an additional armament, it may gird itself with a bellicose gatling cannon or a heavy flamer. The heavier variant of this cannon can be mounted as a ranged weapon or exchanged for a formidable macroplasma cannon. In lieu of heavy flamethrowers, the chassis of the Redemptor may be entwined with either storm bolters or frag storm grenade launchers. Moreover, atop its form, one can place a Karas storm cannon to contend with aerial foes. In summation, the Redemptor Dreadnought emerges as a worthy successor to the Castroferum model, should the issue of rapid pilot depletion be addressed. Herewith concludes our account of the Imperial Dreadnought models. Yet it behooves us to speak of the heroes entombed within their adamantium sarcophagi. Foremost amongst the heroes that mind conjures upon the mention of Dreadnoughts are Bjorn the Fell-Handed of the Space Wolves chapter and Tancred of the Black Templars. However, their sagas have been chronicled in separate tomes, and herein we shall delve into the lesser-known Astartes. Our tale commences with a warrior, perchance older than even Bjorn himself, born upon terror. We speak of the ancient Kalon, a consul of the Ungavar clan company from the Iron Hands. In the dawn of the Great Crusade, Kalon secured not one but many glorious victories. However, he was laid low by orcs during the Battle of Rust, whereupon he was barely saved by an apothecary and placed into stasis before being entombed within the sarcophagus of a dreadnought. Fate dealt Kalon a cruel hand as he was encased within a leviathan pattern dreadnought, wherein he began to lose his grip on sanity. This mentally unstable dreadnought was transferred to Clan Moragul under the command of the infamous Autek Moor, for his company was a haven for orphans and outcasts, it is said that Ferris Manus himself ordered Moore to claim the Mad Son. During the Horus Heresy, Carlon took part in numerous assaults against the World Eaters. His fate post-Heresy remains unknown, but in the 41st millennium he was sighted on Armageddon as part of a Death Watch contingent. This suggests that Calon might have been one of the first Astartes to join the Inquisition. Within the Death Watch, 
there are many dreadnoughts whose tales are untold. The venerable Neolus, for example, materialized as though from the void itself, according to many, instantly becoming an integral part of the garrison at Fortress Talassa Prime. Unlike other dreadnoughts, Neolus bore the Black Shield, an Astartes without a chapter, and joined the Watch already as a dreadnought. The secret of his identity was known to only a long-deceased tech marine who took that knowledge to his grave. Since then, Neolus has become part of Captain Artemis's kill team, frequently aiding in battles against the Eldari and even participating in combat against Eldred Ulthran. Despite a possible dark past, the Watchmen Brethren hold in high esteem both the persona of Neolus himself and his wisdom, augmented by combat prowess. Continuing the discourse on dreadnoughts in the service of the Inquisition, one cannot omit the Grey Knights and their dreadnought steel vigilance. The original name of this knight and the brotherhood from which he hailed remain unknown. However, he and another dreadnought named Jaken were entrusted with a grand mission to oversee a world once invaded by demons, which the Grey Knights managed to contain. As soon as the dreadnought signaled an invasion on the world of Faden Alpha, Forces were dispatched under the command of Librarian Jacon, but this could not save the ancient hero. Steel Vigilance fell in battle against the demons of Sinch, led by Hazria the Believer. The Dreadnought's chassis could not withstand the streams of warp flame unleashed by the demonic chariot, and the ancient hero perished. Yet, let us turn away from the orders under the Inquisition's control and cast our gaze upon the Space Marines, who maintain a tumultuous relationship with it. Of course, this refers to the Great Wolf. This chapter is famed not only for its victories, but also for its secrets, which few suspected before the onset of the 13th Black Crusade. We will discuss one of the most renowned wolf and dreadnoughts, Murderfang. He was discovered by the great companies of Logan Grimnar during a battle against the Chaos Marines on the world of Omnicide. When the wolves first beheld him, he was carving his path through the forces of chaos with unyielding resolve, as though desiring to reunite with his kin. Yet the outcome diverged starkly from his intentions. After a brief but savage combat, Murderfang was subdued, only through the application of cryogenic stasis before being transported to the Fang. His identity remained shrouded in mystery, for his mind had been fully consumed by the curse that afflicts all wolves, from that moment forth, this dreadnought has been imprisoned in an icy cell, only to be thawed when the need arises to obliterate particularly formidable adversaries, after which Murder Fang is once again pacified. However, it appears this ancient warrior retains vestiges of his consciousness, as in the year 999 he aided Logan Grimnar in locating the Wolfen on the doomed world of Vicurus, suggesting they might be the only ones capable of communicating with him in any form. The most comparable entity to a Wolfen Dreadnought, as previously mentioned, is the Death Watch Dreadnoughts of the Blood Angels, which also serve as the final resting places of great heroes. Among them is Moriar the Chosen. Known in life as Captain Morleo Moriar, he was critically wounded on the planet Clamorga and subsequently interred within a dreadnought chassis. Upon awakening, he immediately succumbed to the Black Rage, but over time managed to barely contain his affliction and continue the battle now as a member of the Death Company dreadnoughts. There are whispers that Moriar, in truth, has been ensnared by another curse, known as the Red Thirst, Therefore, the Tech Marines were compelled to modify his sarcophagus that the Chosen might sate his bloodthirst. Yet not all dreadnoughts of the Blood Angels are so wrathful. Among them are those distinguished by astonishing patience. Such a dreadnought is the venerable librarian Marist existence to battles against the Xenos, known as the Octo Calvarii. These aliens were followers of Chaos Undivided and wielded formidable psycho abilities. One of such Xenos managed to subjugate three Imperial planets, and when the Blood Angels arrived to confront him, they found the Octo Calvarii invulnerable. His power was sufficient to instantly heal any wound, and only by paying a tremendous toll was this Xenos captured. Marist was among the victims, and before being entombed in the sarcophagus, he decreed the construction of a prison for the Octo Calvarii. It was built deep beneath the fortress of the angels into the Carceri Arcanum tunnels. Alongside the living Xenos, 
numerous artifacts of chaos, which also could not be destroyed, were placed there. This prison was named Marist's Vault, and the warrior, interred within the Dreadnought Librarian, became its guardian. For 3,000 years, without closing his eyes, he guards the vault, occasionally receiving visitors from among the highest-ranking members of the Order. However, the other angels have not forgotten Marist, and pass down the tale of him to every new neophyte, so that every battle brother may know of the librarian's sacrifice. But not all heroes were fortunate enough to survive in the grim darkness of the far future. Many fell, yet their valour remains honoured by the brethren of their chapters. Among them, however, exists one whose name was nearly forgotten, not only by the citizens of the Imperium, but also by his fellow space marines. This dreadnought is known as Rillanor, once a celebrated warrior among the Emperor's children. Battling since the dawn of the Great Crusade, Rillanor was mortally wounded by the Eldari and encased within a dreadnought. Upon entombment in his sarcophagus, he was bestowed the title of Ancient of Rites, overseeing both neophytes and the Chosen of Fulgrim, to ensure they strayed not from the Legion's sacred traditions. Most of his time, Rillanor spent aboard the cruiser Andronius, maintaining the ritual chamber housed within. As one of the Legion's senior officers, the Dreadnought accompanied his Primarch everywhere, ensuring the execution of his decrees. It was rumoured that Rillanor could detect a man's lie as soon as the first word was spoken. As a loyalist space marine to the Emperor, Rillanor was dispatched to Istvan III, after having reassigned Captain Saul Tarvitz from active duty to the Andronius staff at Tarvitz's request. Upon the revelation of the traitor's schemes, Tarvitz took command of the loyal contingent of the Emperor's children and entrusted Rillanor with guarding a certain underground hangar. After that, the Dreadnought was seen no more, and all presumed him dead. Yet he survived, and for the next ten thousand years, he forged plans of vengeance. Rillanor, by some means, managed to create a psychic beacon to lure his fallen father to the desolate wastelands of Istvan. Nearby, he discovered an unexploded viral bomb, with which the Dreadnought hoped to end Fulgrim. He indeed managed to detonate the bomb at the moment the demon Primarch wrenched the organic remains from the sarcophagus. Ultimately, Fulgrim survived, although his pride was irreparably damaged. Another loyal son of the Emperor met a less horrifying death, sacrificing himself for the salvation of the Imperium. Marshal Magneric was once a legionnaire of the Imperial Fists and was mortally wounded in battle against his brother the warsmith Calcator. A fervent follower of Sigismund, he became part of the Black Templars during the Second Founding and commenced his own personal crusade against the Iron Warriors to exact vengeance upon Calcator. Contemporaries remembered Magneric as emotionally unstable and fanatically, too fanatic even by the standards of the Black Templars. Many attributed this to the fact that the Dreadnought rarely, if ever, entered slumber and only occasionally did his loyal Castellan Rolstan implore his lord to rest. Eventually, Magneric confronted his ancient foe, yet their showdown was interrupted by the looming horde of orcs. The present enemies, once the best of friends, were forced to unite to vanquish the Greenskins. Yet it was not the destiny of Magneric to slay his kin. He sacrificed himself during the Battle of Vandis. Upon his cruiser, the Obsidian Sky, Greenskins made landfall, and after a protracted battle for control of the bridge, Magneric commanded a ramming maneuver against the nearest orc vessel, taking as many Greenskins as possible with him into the fiery abyss. But Magneric was not the only one to be slain by the Xenos. One of the greatest heroes of the Ultramarines, Agrippa, also met his end at the hands of thrice-damned aliens. The Dreadnought, a venerable veteran, had served under the command of Captain Agemon in the first company of Ultramarines, yet he was temporarily attached to the company of Captain Sicarius when the chapter learned of the awakening of the Necrons on Damnos. However, many warriors of the second company believed that Agrippa was sent to oversee Sicarius, as the captain of the first company envied the growing popularity of his brother within the Order. 
After the first skirmish with the Xenos, the captain of the second company was wounded by a Necron overlord known as Immortal. Agrippa managed to destroy the body of Immortal's guardian, and then, with a strike of his power fist, slay the Lord himself, forcing the Necrons to flee. Following the Ultramarines' retreat, the Dreadnoughts under the main librarian of the chapter, Tigurius, took command. Pursuing the Necrons, Agrippa received reports that the Necron forces vastly outnumbered Imperial troops. Thus, the Dreadnoughts had to concede that all the Ultramarines could do was secure the evacuation of the planet. All forces were gathered at the city of Kellenport, but Agrippa launched a series of strikes to slow the advance of the Xenos. As the Necrons descended upon the city walls, a dreadnought stood amidst the maelstrom, inspiring the defenders to feats of valour. Its demise came at the western gates, battling a Necron monolith in solitary defiance. Despite grievous wounds, the Dreadnought managed to annihilate the monolith, securing the evacuation of civilians and space marine brethren. Agrippa, the last ultramarine on the planet, met his end under the searing blasts of a Gauss cannon. Upon the Dreadnought's death, its reactor detonated, obliterating the spaceport and all nearby Necrons in a cataclysmic blaze. This transmission concludes with a tribute to a member of the Adeptus Custodes de Biran Kalimakon. Debiran Kalimakon was among the finest warriors to have fought in the Great Crusade. During the Horus Heresy, the custodian was poisoned by a demon whilst battling alongside the Blood Angels on Cygnus Prime. His flesh slowly peeled from bone, yet undeterred, he continued the fight. After 18 hours, the conflict ceased and Kalimakon was placed into stasis. He remained in suspended animation for years, until the Blood Angels returned to Terra, where De Beeren was entombed in the sarcophagus of the dreadnought Telemann. Henceforth, Kalimakon partook in the Solar War and the Siege of Terra, ensuring his legend would forever echo in the hallowed halls of history.